So uh, while we are moving from boosters, we uh, want to continue to keep uh, the focus on our rates because um, you know we do know that COVID has been going up for the past couple of weeks, and we want to continue to uh, continue to push those uh, vaccination rates. Um, we are still for the residents, we're still hovering around that 80% mark of residents being boosted. Uh, no, and, uh, no major changes from the previous week. Uh, we, we do have actually some positive increases for the staff uh, on the next slide. Um, nationally still we're holding around the 52% of staff being boosted uh, for the week ending uh, May 22nd. Uh, I've looked at all the specific uh, state data. I'm not going to go into it like I did last week. Um, we did have two increases, though, from, from the week prior to, to, the, to this week for the data that's available. And uh, within Maryland, uh, they were at 53%, but are now uh, up to 55.7%. Um, and then Maine had an increase uh, from 57% up to 63.2. Uh, so those two states, you know, continue an increase. Uh, the other states haven't had as drastic of a movement, um, still ho hovering over the rates that I mentioned last week. Um, but uh, generally, uh, New England uh, and uh, our 11 states are uh, faring uh, pretty decently for uh, these uh, staff who are boosted. So we'll get into the, the, the topic for today. So camaraderie, what, what is it really? Uh, the actual definition is mutual trust and friendship among people who spend a lot of time together. Um, but let's get down and dirty. What, what is it really? So camaraderie is actually when people believe their coworkers and see them as complete individuals with families, hobbies, passions outside of work, when they have fun and they celebrate both personal and company milestones, they see, they see themselves as a large team and they go off, out of their way to cooperate and help. So, that, yeah, <laughs> go ahead, Margie. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah. yeah. No, I was like, that definition is truly at the crux of what we're trying to uh, relate to you today. Uh, Margie, jump on in. Yeah. So, um, so you mean make it personal, Josh, then. Yeah. So like a lot of people, uh, it's like, I, I got my work life and I got my home life. But what we're saying here is that camaraderie is really about being authentic and kind of transparent about your life and what you do and who you are and who, who, who your tribe is. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, a lot of people try to keep that work, their work life and personal life separate, but uh, all too often we find that it really starts to blend together um, and we get a full sense of uh, the people that we work with. And we need to embrace that. We need to acknowledge that and we need to um, come together uh, and, and go out of a way to cooperate and help. Uh, and Josh, uh, in uh, person-centered care, you know, as we were reminded that we're actually working in other people's homes, um, bringing that kind of um, that kind of presence into the the home is what really helps to make it home. So really worth, worth remembering. Absolutely. Thanks, Margie. And I appreciate you jumping in. Let's keep this, you know, a conversation amongst everyone. Everyone else, had, if anyone else wants to ju uh, jump in too, let us know. Um, next slide, if you could, uh, Melanie. So why is camaraderie and teamwork important? Well, really enhancing trust and uh, pride in ourselves, pride in the workplace and camaraderie uh, is really a really important task uh, of effective leadership in today's organization. So really need to focus on relationships between your, the employees and their leaders, between the uh, employees and the actual jobs themselves, and then between the employees amongst each other. Uh, there are really great um, indicators to assess uh, great places to work. Uh, that's something that I know Rhode, Rhode Island has a specific, you know, top places in Rhode Island, great places to work. Um, and while it may seem that camaraderie in the workplace is really nice, but not really essential, we ourselves as managers and le leaders shouldn't minimize the importance of team bonding, especially if we're looking at 
are low, uh, if we're trying to lower employee turnover rates um, that have been devastating the nursing home and, and healthcare industry uh, uh, itself. Uh, so consistent with uh, a lot of the measures that the great place to work uh, utilizes, a sense of camaraderie amongst employees is really um, defined by the quality of the uh, intimacy, which is the ability uh, to be oneself at work, the hospitality, which is so, uh, social friendly and welcoming atmosphere, and the community, which is a sense of family or team amongst employees in the workplace. And Margaret, this just goes right back to what you were saying about making uh, feel like a home. Uh, next slide. Uh, I, th I think you might need to click it again because there's some animations. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and it, that's perfect. Uh, so uh, Amy Edmondson, um, who went to uh, a Harvest Business School, she actually talks about uh, something that's called teaming. Um, when we think about uh, teams, you know, you can think about a baseball team or you know uh, a band people who have ample time to practice interacting successfully and efficiently with each other, you know, that's, that's, that's what a team is, but teaming is something different because truth is in the nursing home environment, teams are often uh, disbanded or changed. You could be working on one team right now, but in a few day, days or weeks, your team is gonna look completely different. And teaming is really just teamwork on the fly and it involves coordinating, collaborating without the benefit of a stable team structure. Um, because, you know, like I mentioned, you know, nursing homes don't necessarily have um, the comfort of having that stable staff environment 100% uh, of the time. So having to constantly shift the nature of the roles and the work uh, means that everyone needs to be on top of their toes and really to just pitch in and help each other uh, as much as possible. Uh, Margie and Melanie, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on this and how, you know, how teams are constantly shifting within the nursing home environment. Yes, Josh, it, it just comes to light when you're thinking in a nursing home and, and teaming, teaming is happening constantly in a nursing home. You could start your unit at, with uh, four CNAs and something happens, somebody has to go home. Now you're down to three or somebody floats to another unit and now you have a new team. So, so constantly being ready and, and teaming and developing how we're gonna work together today to manage this situation and this is our team today. And so I like the idea of not thinking about it as this concrete process with these concrete people and that the team and the teaming is the actions you're having together. So the teamwork on the fly. Love it. Love it. And um, Josh, I would just say, just uh, don't forget the folks that you don't ordinarily think of. You know, there's other departments and other folks and some of the tasks can be actually done by other folks. It's just that we're not used to in engaging them in it. <laughs> so, you know, Think about who else can do certain things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, it, you know, it goes back to actively building, you know, systems within our own facility uh, with the understanding that a team's composition can change at any given moment. Uh, so it's really interesting what she has to go on to say. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, Another thing that I had wanted to talk about too is uh, Google themselves had actually tried to uh, understand what makes a good team. Um, and here are the, some of their findings. Of the five uh, key uh, dynamics uh, that they had found to uh, create an effective teams, psychologically, uh, psychological safety was by far the most important element uh, that they had identified. And the researchers in, in this study that uh, they had uh, conducted found that individuals on teams with higher psychological safety are less likely to leave the organization. Uh, they're le le uh, more likely to harness the power of diverse ideas from their teammates um, and ultimately provide uh, better outcomes uh, for the facility. Uh, Amy Edmondson also found that psychological safety uh, 
was also one of the most important uh, aspects of uh, teaming within multiple healthcare arenas. Uh, and then some of the other elements are, you know, the dependability where team members are able uh, to depend on one each other, uh, structure and clarity, having clear roles, plans and goals, uh, meaning behind the work, you know, the work that is meaningful uh, to, the, to the team members, and then the impact that the work has uh, on, on the team itself. So psychological safety, want to spend a little bit more time talking about that. Next slide, please. So psychological safety is the belief that you won't be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistake. Um, a lack of psychological safety uh, at work has actually uh, has major uh, organization and business repercussions. Uh, when people don't feel comfortable talking about initiatives that aren't working, the organization isn't going to be equipped uh, to prevent uh, that, those failures. So when, uh, when employee, and then therefore when the employees aren't fully committed, the organization has really lost an opportunity to leverage strengths from their own team members. Uh, you can click again, uh, Melanie, because there's some animations. I apologize, thank you. <laughs> so uh, psychological safety and accountability, it's not really one or the other. Uh, both are really necessary to create a learning environment. So psychological safety uh, actually begins with a uh, feeling of belonging, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, which shows that all humans require their basic needs to be met before they can reach their full potential. Uh, so employees must therefore feel accepted uh, before they can con uh, they're able to fully contribute uh, in ways to improve the, the facility themselves. So there's a couple of um, different um, stages before they can feel that they are able to make valuable contributions uh, and, and challenge the status quo within the facility. Uh, the stage one is the inclusion of safety. So inclusion safety uh, satisfies the basic human need to connect and belong. In this stage, you're, you're, you feel free to be yourself and are accepted for who you are, including uh, your unique attributes and defining characteristics. Uh, stage two is learner safety. So learner safety satisfies uh, the need to learn and grow. And in this stage, you feel that uh, you feel safe to ex exchange in the learning process by asking questions and giving and receiving feedback, uh, as well as experimenting and making mistake mistakes. Uh, stage three is contributed uh, safety, which uh, satisfies the need to make a difference. So you feel safe to use your skills and abilities to make meaningful contribution. And then stage four is challenge of safety where it uh, satisfies the need to make things bigger. So you feel safe to speak up and challenge the status quo when you think there's an opportunity uh, to change or improve. So to help your employees navigate through the various stages and ultimately land in a place where they feel comfortable uh, and in, uh, with interpersonal you know, risk taking and speaking up, uh, we as leaders need to make sure that we're nurturing and promoting uh, the team's sense of psychological safety within the workplace. Uh, next slide, please. So Josh, what you're saying is um, in order to get to joy in work, yes, people have to trust each other, huh? And right. in, in order to trust each other, you have to be kind of uh, transparent and kind of out there with each other. Yeah, like I said, it, it, it doesn't, it's not psychological safety or accountability. It's not hard stop one or the other. Uh, it's both are necessary to create that learning environment where we uh, people can feel comfortable um, to bring up their concerns, to make mistakes. Uh, but there is a sense of accountability as well. It's not black and white. We need you need both. Um, and so there are a couple of different ways that you can go about creating that psychological safety within the workplace. Uh, you can make it uh, specifically uh, an explicit priority, talk about the importance uh, of creating psychological safety at work, uh, make sure that everyone is speaking up. Uh, Melanie, I know we were just talking about it this morning, uh, making sure that everyone has a chance and, and an opportunity to, to discuss and uh, let their thoughts be known. 
uh, it's really easy as leaders to just uh, overtake a conversation and not give everyone the opportunity that they need uh, to uh, bring up their thoughts. Uh, number three, establish norms for how failures are handled. So don't punish experimentation uh, and reasonable risk taking. Uh, encourage learning from failure and disappointment. I mean, in our entire lives from kids that are growing up, we're constantly making mistakes and learning from it. And that doesn't stop once we enter the workplace. Uh, so openly share your hard lessons learned from mistakes. Um, and also, um, you know, let that, let that be normal. Um, you know, create uh, a space for new ideas, even the wild ones, uh, and, and embrace that productive uh, conflict. So promote dialogue and productive debate, make sure it doesn't get personal, it doesn't get too heated, but to, uh, talk about uh, and debate and encourage uh, people to talk about what they believe the best uh, course of action is uh, for any specific problem. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so why can't some why can some teams come together and and tackle uh, specific challenges and then others can't? Uh, it really comes down to uh, your the mindset, your uh, your ability to use uh, different skills. Effectively depends on the mindset that you start with. So by mindset, I mean values and assumptions that you put. Uh, that you use to put your behaviors into action. So practicing these specific different behaviors requires that you have uh, a, a learning mindset and reflecting in uh, various core values and assumptions. So the, the core values that contribute to its team success are that transparent to transparency, the curiosity, informed choice, accountability, and compassion. Uh, Margie, I don't know if you have anything you want to speak to on this slide. Um, I think I think you got it. I think you nailed it. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I, I think the right hand column kind of says it all. And um, I know also that when times are tough as they are right now, um, some of the left hand column kind of comes into play um, because a lot of times we have agency staff on a team, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's you know, sometimes it's just more difficult because we have a lot of new players all the time. And, uh, you know, people are under a lot of duress. But as much as we can move to that right column, it really encouraging that kind of kind of um, transparency and conversation and really digging in so that teams are compassionate with, with each other and still accountable. That's where it really makes all the difference. Okay, thanks, Margie. Uh, next slide. I knew it might have to click a couple of times. <laughs> thanks, Margie. I did this eight of them. So there are actually a couple of different uh, specific behaviors that you can utilize to improve how team members can work together. Um, and they provide more guidance than relatively abstract not notions like treat everyone with respect and you know be constructive. And they're a lot less procedural than, you know, make sure you're putting yourselves on vibrate when you do meetings or starting meetings on time and ending on time. Uh, these are actually like more explicit behaviors that you and your team members uh, are able to try and specifically apply them consistently in your work process to help support uh, teaming. Melanie, uh, Margaret, anything else you want to add? No, this is okay. this <laughs> all right. Perfect. I'm just I'm just making sure you guys want to have an opportunity to, to discuss as well. Uh, next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> this brings us to uh, the autocratic pyramid. So sometimes leaders make a bad decision or harm team morale by making autocratic decisions without involving others. Uh, conversely, on the other times, they waste a lot of time. Uh, by uh, unnecessarily involving them. So how do you know when to uh, how do you know when and how much to involve your team uh, in the in, in decisions? So it's important to make sure that your team have a clear understanding of the decision making rule for the team. Uh, many people seem to think that decisions uh, are either top down or collaborative uh, and tend, and then tend to prefer one or 
or the other, especially as leaders, we start, tend to, you know, gravitate toward one or the other. But there are, like, that is a false dichotomy. You, there is no clear cut uh, division between autocratic and collaborative decision making. It's more, you need to think about it more of as a continuum. Um, there is a legitimate application for the various levels of this decision making uh, pyramid. Sometimes, uh, you know, some questions that you need to ask yourself when you're making a decision in regards to uh, something going on in your facility and your teams, ask yourself, you know, is this a decision? Uh, is this your decision that you need to make? Whose responsibility is to make this decision? Uh, you know, if it's not your decision to make, you know, start working towards the bottom of that part, uh, pyramid. Uh, do you have the access to the, to, to the needed information? Uh, do you know everything uh, you need to know about to make an intelligent decision? Do you have the necessary expertise? And if so, uh, if your uh, if your decision has the support, if it, is it needed or is it guaranteed or, or is it guaranteed? You know, you might lean towards that uh, top part of the pyramid. So, a couple of questions that you can ask yourselves. I can uh, circle back in chat um, with these questions. I want to continue moving on um, and just get a good understanding of what uh, the decision ma making process looks like. Next slide, please. So, Josh, yep. you know, I, this one, I think, is a, is somewhat hard to manage at certain times. So you, you get a group of folks together and you're really using that team approach and you are making decisions as a team. And then suddenly the leadership decide something on the fly, mm -hmm. it's important for teams to realize there's times where that's actually going to have to happen because there's constraints, there's rationale, they may not have all of the information for, but I, so I just, I think this can be hard because people like to be involved with all decision making once you de de develop that team, but realizing that leadership sometimes just have to do certain things in a certain time frame is important for all levels of staff to know. Right. So always taking into consideration the urgency of the decision that needs to be made. Um, you know, if the building's on fire and there's smoke coming out the door, it doesn't really call for a group. doesn't make sense to call the group together to discuss their options, you know. Um, I've actually had that happen, and I was pointing <laughs> and directing and moving things. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but uh, a lot of a lot of other situations, though, uh, like you mentioned, um, aren't as urgent as they seem. So it, you know, sometimes it it you know takes that autocratic decision, but then sometimes not. So it, it's not black and white like uh, what we talked about earlier. It, 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 every single one of these is uh, inappropriate. Uh, action at some point, depending on the decision decision that needs to be made. Uh, next slide. So, yep, uh, using the collaborative uh, decision uh, making tools. So, you know, this is just you know a basic uh, decision making process. Uh, talks about uh, con uh, convergent thinking. So, it, you know, if if the copy machine breaks, you know, a convergent thinker would just call a technician right away to fix the copy machine, but uh, divergent thinking, uh, if the co copy machine breaks, a divergent thinker might try to determine the root cause of the copy machine's malfunction and assess various ways to fix the problem. So one option might be called the technician, the op other option might be looking up a DIY video on YouTube. <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, uh, you need to uh, think about how the thought process um, with these ideas affect how you go about solving them as well. So uh, next slide, please. So you can go about brainstorming like usual and discover what the possible causes are for, for the problem, define what one cause should we try to solve, and then uh, deduce what are, are all the possible solutions to the problem, and then determine what the best solution of the problem is. Uh, this is a, a nice uh, little tool and graph about the decision-making process and different areas that you can specifically uh, focus on. Um, but I know that we're getting short on time. Uh, Margie, I'll pass it over to you to talk about the ICANN. Josh, um, thanks. Th thanks. And I know we're just a few minutes out 
Uh, so I just want to share with folks that a great example of great teamwork, some of you have done team steps, so you might have kind of an affinity toward that, but something that we've done during this process of um, during COVID was we actually created what we call the shift coach role. And so we created a team of shift coaches among CNAs who would extend the reach of the infection preventionist. Infection preventionists sometimes often end up being the kind of like um, lone ranger in a nursing home. And instead of having that person responsible for everything related to infection prevention, what we did was we established a small gang of coaches who would coach their teammates and folks on the floor while they were doing their work, just reminding them about simple infection prevention processes. And so next slide shows how we developed a kind of see it, say it, solve it kind of mentality. And what that did was that if, a, if somebody sees something going on, they say something about it, and then in their huddles, they actually work to solve it. So see it, say it, solve it, with a, with a shift coach kind of at the helm. I love this because it works so well. And then take a look at this next slide. Now just buzz through real quickly. We, we really killed you with animation today, Melanie, so sorry. It really creates a solid communication structure through huddles. Um, there's more people engaged in infection prevention. That makes it so great because people are able to talk more easily all the things that Josh just spoke about, that, that kind of um, ability for folks to share ideas without feeling like anybody's going to, you know, um, you know, refute that. Everybody's open and honest about what's going on. It looks a little bit like this. Take a look at this. Basically, the short story is we identify shift coaches, those folks who kind of tend to be those informal leaders out on the floor anyway. They're great help. Um, we train them to be a shift coach. We give them very specific responsibilities. We teach them how to coach, not cop, not be a cop, but to be a coach so that they're actually working with their other teammates. They offer just-in-time training so that right then in the moment, when they see something happening, they, in a really gentle way, they're able to say, hey, I noticed that you've been wearing your, your mask below your nose quite a bit lately, and I know how hot it gets in the summer. Can, can we talk about that? Maybe see what kinds of things we might be able to do in order for you to keep that mask up. What, what are some things we can do? And so then um, people actually do observations, keep an eye on those things. But what happens is they actually have a little tracking tool they keep in their pocket. And then in the morning, they come together, all the shift coaches come together to share some of the things that they've been noticing, um, maybe some trends that are happening, maybe some things that can be improved upon. And then in step six, they actually work toward developing solutions. So maybe having a hand sanitizer rather than outside a residence room, maybe inside a residence room, so that as people walk out, that's when they do their um, uh, hand hygiene right on the spot. So people come up with solutions right there in the huddle. And what happens is the um, infection preventionist captures some of that conversation, uses a tracking tool, and then begins to review what things we can make an improvement on. It's a great quality improvement process. Those things that pop up a lot, maybe she needs to do some new education, or maybe there's something that needs to change in the environment. And so it gives her or him a great opportunity to look at what's going on, review those things, and then celebrate success because the folks who have done shift coaching have found that they've been able to do some great work preventing the spread of COVID, but also doing some neat things around awareness within their organization. So that's the quick that's the quick ICANN program. We can teach you how to do it, and we'll even help you to set up a shift coach program in your organization. So whew, there you go, Josh. Perfect. Wow. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> 
So we're, we're coming to an end. We're two minutes over, but Josh and Margie, thanks so much. And Mary Ellen, thank you for running chat. That was so helpful. And we love to hear your feedback and we have some good, good uh, feedback in the chat. If you're enjoying this series, let us know. If you're walking away with learning something, let us know because this is exciting for us. We wanna, we wanna highlight the work we're doing. Um, again, we are, uh, we are iPro, your Quinn QIO. We work with uh, Clarence and HCA across 11 different states. We're going to be re-showing this uh, program 3.30 on Wednesday. This week's IP3 at 11 o'clock on Thursday. We're going to go over the new uh, recommendations with NHSN, the changes, and work out any kinks related to that. Um, and then our following IP3, the next Thursday, we're going to talk about being a new IP and what, what you needed to know as a new IP and long-term care. So, Margie, did you have anything else to add before we close up? I'm like, woohoo. Um, yeah, <laughs> call us. We can help you. Yes, we're here for you. Josh? Oh, that's it. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Mary Ellen, for your help. Thanks, everybody. Bye thank now. You.